My name is Katrina Zeno, and I am the founder of Theology of the Body for Everyone. And I'd like to welcome you to this talk, whether you're single or you're married, uh, you're a priest, you're in religious life, uh, because my hope is, is that there will be something for everyone in this talk, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're a priest, that you will be able to find a deeper meaning and purpose for your life as a single person, or if you're married or if you're a seller, be able to help those single people in your life live a more meaningful and fulfilled life as a single person. So it's my privilege to share with you via video a rather delicate topic, the single life. Now, why do I say that it's delicate? Well, it's because I'm sure you've noticed there are lots of opinions swirling around within and without the church on the meaning and the status of the single life. So people ask, is the single life a formal vocation like marriage and celibacy? Or is it just a temporary state? Does being single, and this is the one I hear the most, indicate that somehow you've missed God's plan, God's will for your life, or that you're just too picky, or you haven't put yourself out there enough? Or should we as singles do our best effort to get rid of our singleness? Should that be the priority number one in our life? Or can it be regarded not as a deprivation, but actually as an opportunity and a gift? So these are very honest, raw, and real questions for those of us who are single in a married world. Uh, well, actually, I should correct myself. It's not a married world. You see, a number of years ago, I was bemoaning being single, the struggles of being single to a dear friend. And she looked me straight in the eye and she said, no, you're wrong, Katrina. Because I was bemoaning the struggles of being single in a married world. And she said, no, you're wrong, Katrina. It's not a married world anymore. It's a couple's world. <gasps> ding, ding. Oh, my goodness. Her words hit the bullseye. Just look around you at our culture. Even if we still consider marriage between a man and a woman as God's wise and beautiful plan for humanity, and isn't this precisely what this conference is all about, what it celebrates? Well, the world around us, we have to take note, is playing by distinctly different rules. It's not a married world anymore. It's a couple's world. And so to be a single in a couple's world can sometimes feel like you're walking around with a big L on your forehead. Loser, loser. After all, any normal person should be able to find someone and couple up, right? Well, this leads to the title of my talk, which is precisely the single life pickle juice or champagne. And it comes with a story that I'd like to share. Uh, a young man got his first apartment by himself while in college, and after a couple months, he invited his parents over for the first time. And they arrived, and his mother looked around the apartment and noticed, wow, it's clean. The laundry were in, was in the drawers. There were no dirty dishes in the sink. And she thought to herself, well, I guess I didn't do such a bad job raising him after all. So after they got a tour of the apartment, the young man asked his parents, hey, would you like something to drink? And his mom thought, Oh, he's even learned how to be a host. So she asked, well, what do you have? And he said, well, let me check and see. And so the young man walked over to the refrigerator. He opened it up and he said, um, champagne or pickle juice? <laughs> well, in a couple's world, I think the second option can pretty much describe the single life. It's pickle juice. It appears rather sour and unappealing, something that you'd rather get rid of instead of sip with your friends. But I think there's another way of looking at the single life, that we can look at it like champagne. And I hope that's what we can uncork today by considering the single life as bubbling with possibilities, possibilities that create a new way of being single that's meaningful and fulfilling. So in order to discover this new way of being single, let's go to scripture to look at God's plan for every person revealed through Genesis 127, which says, 
God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So notice he doesn't say he only mar created married people in his image and likeness. No, he created every single one of us in his image and likeness. And so the most, most important reason why the single life is champagne and not pickle juice is that you are made, you are created in the image and likeness of God. But if I were to ask you to close your eyes for a moment, why don't you do that? And just picture God in your mind. What image would come immediately to mind? Like, what does God look like when we say we're made in the image and likeness of God? Okay, you can open your eyes. In my experience of asking hundreds, maybe even thousands of people that question, here's the most common image that comes to people's mind. It's an old man with a long white beard. Now, I don't know about you, but at least for me as a woman who's single, thinking that I'm made in the image and likeness of God, who's an old man with a long white beard, okay, it doesn't really sound like the champagne life. It sounds more like, well, pickle juice. So I want to slightly modify this scripture by adding one simple word. It's this, we're made in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God. That changes everything. Because if we're made in the image and likeness of the Trinity, well then does that mean that we're made in the image and likeness of a shamrock? Uh, I hope not. How about the image and likeness of three mean judges waiting to punish us if we do something wrong? I hope not that either. How about an old man, a young man, and a bird? Can you see how important it is? Who we understand God to be in his Trinitarian nature? That determines everything we understand who the human person is and called to be, including those of us who are single. Okay, I don't think any of those images uh, bring us any closer to the champagne life. So this is where St. John Paul II and his writings on the human person can help. So drawing from the language in his writing, here's the way I like to describe God as Trinity. To say God is Trinity means the Father pours himself out in a total gift of love to the Son. The Son pours himself out in a total gift of love to the Father. And the Holy Spirit bursts forth or overflows as the fruit of their total self-giving love. It's such a great description of the Trinity. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the Father pouring himself out in a total gift of love to the Son? The Son receiving that total gift of love and responding with his own total gift of love? To the Father and the Holy Spirit is bursting forth. It's over, he's overflowing as the fruit of their total self-giving love. Okay, now maybe you're the kind of person who's not so much into words, but you're more into images. Okay, so here's my visual image, my visual aid to try to describe this inner life of the Trinity. Let's see if I can do this. So to get, say God is Trinity means the Father pours himself out in a total gift of love to the Son. The son pours himself out in a total gift of love to the father. And then they stop, right? No. From all eternity, father and son have been pouring themselves out into a gift to each other. And the Holy Spirit has been overflowing as the fruit of their total self-giving love. But here's what else is so, so key. This overflow, can you see? That's you. You see, you, you are the overflow of the love between the father and the son in the Holy Spirit. That means this is who you are in your deepest, deepest meaning. And that reveals that you, you are loved, loved, loved endlessly and eternally by the Father, by the Son and the Holy Spirit, by the whole Trinity. It also means something else. If you were made in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God, then that means you are created to be a gift. That's who you're created to be, a gift. Okay, this moment you might be saying, wait, 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 hold the phone, Katrina. Have you forgotten who you're talking to? We're singles. We don't have anyone to make our gift of self to. And I just say, I get it. It took me a long time and lots of pain to grasp this truth in my own life. 
You see, I was married for 10 years. And then in my early 30s, my marriage was shattered. And suddenly, I was everything I never wanted to be. Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe you're single because you were married. And then your marriage failed. Or maybe you're single because you lived with someone together. Or maybe a couple someones. And those relationships broke up. Or maybe you're single just because you're still single. You see, I was suddenly everything I never wanted to be. A single working mom living barely above the poverty line. I felt like a loser. As a matter of fact, the last thing I felt like was a gift. <laughs> that didn't ever even cross my mind to describe me and my identity as a gift. And then, then a man came into my life and changed everything. And that man's name was Pope John Paul II, who literally came into my life and changed everything. In 1999, shortly after the failure of my marriage, I met Pope John Paul II personally in Rome. Okay, if you look at this picture, can you find me in it? I know it doesn't really look like me, but that's me with the dark curly hair. And that's my son, Michael, when he was five, meeting John Paul personally after one of his private morning masses in Rome. And just after this photo was taken, John Paul II put his hand on my forehead and he blessed me. And in that moment, I experienced receiving a portion of his spirit. Thank goodness, because that spirit has guided and helped me understand St. John Paul II's writings for over 25 years. And it's also helped me decipher, decipher the meaning of my life as a single person. I'd like to share with you one of the most life-changing quotes from St. John Paul II for me. It's from his apostolic letter entitled, The Dignity and Vocation of Women. And it's from section number seven that says, to say that man, meaning man, woman, married, single, the human person. So to say that man is created in the image and likeness of God, can you hear Genesis 127, means that man is called to exist for others, to become, there's that word, gift, to become gift. There's that four letter word that changed my life. So this concept of gift, I like to say, is the centerpiece of St. John Paul II's writings and his thought. And where do you think he might have gotten this idea, this concept of gift from? Uh, do you think that he made it up? Do you think that maybe the Blessed Mother revealed it to him in a dream? Do you think it's part of one of the Vatican II documents? Or do you think this idea of gift goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. Which one do you think? Well, if you guess number three, you're right. It's part of the one, one of the Vatican II documents. And the name of that document is Gaudium et Spes in Latin. In English, it's called the Pastoral Constitution on the, uh, on the Church in the Modern World. It's kind of a mouthful. But just remember GS, Gaudium et Spes, GS 24, which says, Man, again, meaning the human person, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. The way you fulfill yourself and find meaning and purpose in your life, even as a single pe person, is not by hoarding your gift of self. It's also not by reaching out and grasping someone else's gift of self, or like I was, by bemoaning your singleness to someone. No, no. You see, the way you fulfill yourself is by making a sincere gift of yourself. I think many people have the impression that theology of the body primarily applies to married people. And so single people are kind of left out. But can I just say I've only known theology of the body as a single person? That's the only way I've known it. Because theology of the body is primarily about imaging a Trinitarian God by being a gift. And 
that applies to everyone, married and single, young and not so young, with children and without children, we're all created to be a gift. I'd like to offer just one quote from Theology of the Body that reveals this Trinitarian view of the human person. It's from Theology of the Body, audience nine, section number three, and it says this, man, again, meaning the human person, man, woman, married, single. So man becomes an image of God. Can you hear this theme, this theme of Genesis 127? So man becomes an image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. Okay, now I know that when people hear the word communion, it's easy to think it means the M word, marriage. But in JP2's mind, that's not what communion means. For John Paul II, communion means gift. It's the G word. You see, even though we are single, we are not created to be alone. We are created for a communion of persons. And this communion of persons comes about in our life through gift. Gift of self to God and gift of self to others. Okay, now I think we're getting somewhere because this is something we can all toast that we're all created for a communion of persons with God and others by making this gift of ourselves. So for us as single persons, what does this gift of self, this communion of persons look like? Well, how many of you have ever heard the saying, problems are opportunities in work clothes? Have you ever heard that expression? Well, I think it's a great reminder to not automatically resist or get upset or walk away from problems because if we look deeper, they're offering us, they're offering us new opportunities. So if we take this approach and apply it to the single life, then we could say, the single life is the gift of self in work clothes. Isn't that quite the paradigm shift? The single life is the gift of self in work clothes. In other words, instead of being tempted to say, oh, I'm still single, <sighs> what am I gonna do with this pickle juice? Perhaps we could look at our single life as a new way to be single, as a new way to make as, as opportunities to make a gift of self, bursting with opportunities to make a gift of self, even if it comes in work clothes. So for the last part of this talk, I'd like to look at three ways singles can make a gift of self to people we don't know, to people we do know, and to change society and the workplace from within. So how many of you have heard the expression, practice random acts of kindness? I find most people have heard this and they, they rather like this expression. They find it inspiring. You know what, I should practice random acts of kindness. Okay, I think we can do one better. What if we adopted practicing regular acts of kindness? Or even better, as singles, what if we took on as our life mission, as our life motto to practice regular gifts of self? Wow, wouldn't that change the world? Can you just imagine for a moment where every person, every single person woke up every morning dedicated to practicing regular gifts of self, to thinking, hmm, how can I make my gift of self today to a stranger? Imagine the gifts of self we would all receive every day. So I'd like to share two experiences where strangers made a gift of self to me. The first happened in 2014 when I have the, had the privilege of attending St. John Paul II's canonization mass in Rome. So here's an actual photo uh, taken at that canonization mass. Now I had stayed up the whole night before, no sleep, right? And, and was out there, you know, in the street with I don't know how many thousands of other people waiting all night for them to 
open the, um, the barricade to get right into St. Peter's Square. And somewhere along, I don't know, maybe six o'clock in the morning, suddenly people started moving forward. And I thought, okay, this is it. So I started moving forward with them. Have you ever been in a crowd moving forward all at once? It feels like you're in a tube of toothpaste being squeezed forward. Well, that's the way I was. And then suddenly we stopped. And you know, I wasn't in Cedar, St. Peter's Square, but I was just a little bit outside of it in that long street, right? That goes right off of it down the center. And I thought, this is not bad. And then suddenly we started moving again. And I thought, oh, I can get maybe into the square. But then I noticed that the people off to my right who had been right at the edge of the barricade, they left the barricade and, and they went moving towards St. Peter's Square. And I thought, well, I could maybe get to St. Peter's Square or I could maybe just um, put myself right on the barricade. There was a jumbotron right in front of it and I would have a great view. So that's what I did. So I made a sharp right turn. I went over to the barricade. And so I stood there waiting and right beside me was an Italian man. And the policeman kept coming along, trying to shoo us away from the barricade, like, you know, move on, move on. And he made it perfectly clear to them in Italian uh, that he was not moving and neither was I. So I was like, okay, I will just stay here. So even though I don't speak Italian, it was perfectly obvious by his gestures, that's what he was saying. So that's where I was. Oh, and I had such a beautiful experience of this canonization mass. And then the time came for Holy Communion. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but how do you give Holy Communion to hundreds of thousands of people? Well, all of a sudden a priest appeared right in front of me. And so I went up and I received communion. And then I stepped to the side and I squatted down to make myself as small as possible because suddenly there were hundreds of people moving forward behind us to receive communion, to come up to the barricade. And I was so afraid that I would get squished. And I noticed that suddenly my Italian railmate did the same thing. He also squatted down. And then ever so silently and gently, he went and he put his arm around me and grabbed the, um, you know, the rail on the barricade on the other side of me and cocooned me in this space of protectiveness. And I thought, wow, the Lord has given me my own Italian Saint Joseph, right? the protector of the universal church. This man, a stranger, I didn't even know him. He made this beautiful and so sincere gift of self to me. And I will never forget that feeling of being protected with my own Italian St. Joseph. I'd like to share another story about a gift of self to someone I didn't know. I love to hike. And anyone who's listened to any of my talks after a while discovers two things about me. One, I love to dance, Argentine tango and salsa in particular. And also I love to hike and my favorite place to hike, here's a picture of it, is Sedona, Arizona. So one day I was hiking my favorite trail, which was around this mountain. It's called the Cathedral Rock. It's about a four hour trail and it was uh, summer, so it was pretty hot. And I noticed about halfway through my hike, so two hours, that my water container, my water bladder in my backpack, I hadn't sealed it all the way. And so almost all the water had leaked out. Now I was on the other side of these mountains and I still had two hours to go and it was very hot. And I was suddenly very worried. Well, shortly after that, I met two college young men who were hiking the same trail and we stopped and we chatted for a little bit. And then, you know, we said goodbye and they were hiking the same trail in front of me. So they walked on. And about two minutes, not even, maybe 25 seconds later, one of them, he was maybe 10 feet in front of me. He turned around and he said, you don't by any chance need some water, do you? Okay, I have hiked hundreds of trails. 
I've never had anyone stop and ask me if I needed water. I said to him, well, as a matter of fact, I do. So he gave me an unopened bottle of water. Wow. A gift of self from someone I didn't even know. I'm sure you can think of numerous examples of how we can make a gift of self to strangers, to people we don't even know. So for instance, asking a cashier in the store how his or her day is going and really meaning it. I mean, like attentive, tentatively listening, tentatively listening to what comes back or letting someone go in front of you in traffic and not reacting angrily or not reacting angrily to the person who just cut you off. I mean, they might never know that you're making a gift of self to them, but you are. Or putting your smartphone away and talking to the person in front of you in line or in the waiting room with you. Have you noticed now, anytime you're in a waiting room, it's like everybody's in their own little device bubble. Nobody talks to each other. Oh, what if we were completely countercultural and didn't pull our device out and actually struck up a conversation with someone? or using tweezers that you happen to carry in your hiking backpack to remove a jumping cactus from the shoe of an unsuspecting hiker who'd picked one up. Okay, it's a real story. It happened to me last week. There was this um, older couple and we were walking by them on the trail and I noticed that he was trying to get a jumping cactus off of his shoe. And I always carry tweezers in my backpack for that exact reason. So I pulled them out and I pulled off the cactus from him, from his shoe. So you see, these are simple gifts of self. They're thoughtful gifts of self. They're regular gifts of self that we can make to people we don't even know. All right, how about regular gifts of self to people that we do know? So for instance, how about helping a friend pack and then move? Those can, that can be overwhelming, especially as a single person. Or this is one of my favorites buying a dozen roses and giving them to a single female colleague at work or one of your female friends. Because if you're single and you're a woman, you know we almost never get a dozen roses. What a beautiful way to make a gift of self to a friend that you do know. Or you can pay for a friend's round of golf. Or you can take someone to the airport at 5 a.m. instead of telling them, oh, you know, just get an Uber. Say, no, 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 you don't have to get an Uber, I'll take you. We're helping to start a youth group or a young adult group at your parish. Okay, that's definitely an opportunity in work clothes. So every day, multiple times a day, we can live in the image and likeness of Trinitarian God, how? By making regular gifts of self to people we know and people we don't know. So what about this third one? Regular gifts of self to change society and the workplace from within. I think unfortunately, most of us are familiar with computer viruses, even if we haven't experienced one directly, thank God, we know what they can do. We know that they are so damaging because they work from within. They get into the hard drive of the computer and they mess it all up. Well, I think God is asking us as singles to be holy viruses, that our call, our mission is to get into the circuitry of society and the workplace and to do what? To spread holiness from within because that's what a holy virus spreads is it spreads holiness. We need to constantly remind each other that God has led us to our secular professions and occupations to work for the sanctification of the world from within as leaven. That's from another one of the Vatican II documents, the dogmatic constitution on the church. That God leads us to our professions and occupations so that we can work from within for the sanctification, for the holiness of the world. So I love this aspect of our mission as singles in the world. Why? Because we can go where churchy people can't go. Right? We can go to the boardroom. We can go into the classroom. 
we can go and work at construction sites. We can go to the gym. Just think about all these places. Do you think that they could use a holy virus penetrating and changing these places for the better from within? So just think for a moment about these places. Do people relate to each other according to the spirit of the gospel by respecting each other's dignity? Are all the business decisions made according to Christian ethics and ecological stewardship? Do people dress in a way that honors the body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, even and especially in the gym? Do the movies, music, and binge watching people talk about acknowledge God and his plan for our lives? Or do they ignore God or cut him out of the picture altogether? You see, this, this is an opportunity in work clothes. clothes. Right? This is where you are called to make your regular gift of self. So I'd ask you to ask yourself, in your business decisions, do you ever compromise on business ethics? Or can you make your gift of self by resolving that you will never compromise on ethics in the workplace? Do you dress in a way that honors the body and the bodies of others? Are you a witness by the movies you watch or the ones you don't watch? The jokes you tell or the jokes you don't tell? The way you refuse to talk about coworkers behind their backs? These are all ways that we can witness by our lives and by our words by being a holy virus in the workplace, and especially how you date. That is such a testimony to others around us. What you do on the weekends, right on Monday morning, everyone, hey, what'd you do this weekend? What'd you do this weekend? Well, what do you say? Again, is it a way that brings glory to God and testifies to his plan? his beautiful sacramental plan for our lives or how you speak about marriage and human sexuality when it comes up in conversation. These are all such significant ways that life is presented to us as opportunities in work clothes that our gift of self can be given to fulfill the purpose of our lives by making this gift of self in the image and likeness of a Trinitarian God. So as singles, this is our mission. And those of you who are married, who are clergy, who are religious, I want to ask you, please encourage us as singles in this mission. Ask us, how are we making a gift of self to people we know, to people we don't know, to change society in the workplace from the, within? You see, we are not singles sitting on the sideline. Say, waiting, waiting, waiting for our real life to begin. No, we, we can change the world one gift to self at a time. To people we know, to people we don't know, and to change society and culture from within. By living our vocation through holiness. That's what Vatican II said, that every single person has the universal call, the universal, universal vocation to holiness. So how can we be holy viruses in every aspect and in every situation of our lives? And that, my dear single friends, that is the champagne life bubbling with possibilities. So I'd like to invite you if you're single, to pray this prayer with me. Even if you're not single, you can pray this prayer with me. And I wanna encourage you to pray it every day to remind us who God has created us to be, how he's given us this vocation, this mission of holiness expressed through this gift of self. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
Amen. And feel free to pray this with me. Oh, Holy Spirit, I come before you this day and ask you to dwell in the center of my life. Pour out upon me your gifts, graces, and charisms to perfect my love, increase my holiness, strengthen and expand my gift of self, and create a space with my, in my heart and life to welcome others. Consecrate me in my daily duties within the workplace and society and help me to live my sexuality as a prophetic sign of the inner life of the Trinity and the fruitful love of Christ for the church. Purify and mature my love day by day and year by year so that my life and my words testify to the absolute and unfailing love and fidelity of Trinitarian love for each person. Teach me how to pray, how to sacrifice, how to be joyful, and how to love as Christ loves through a total, free, faithful, and fruitful gift of self. Finally, Spirit of the Father and Son, Heal the wounds from my past and present. Release me from patterns of addiction and negative speech. And help me to be quick to forgive, eager to seek the sacrament of reconciliation, and devoted to a worthy reception of the Eucharist. Make your love visible through me. Come, Holy Spirit, and make me holy. Amen. May God, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. May God bless you and may you remember always that you are a gift.